Magandang araw po. Uh, nyo nga sa'yo. Uh, welcome to the 8th Philippine Korean Studies Symposium. I am J.R. Igno from the UP Department of Linguistics and I will be your moderator in the second day's morning program. For more than a decade, we have witnessed how PKSS has been able to evolve adapting to various and drastic changes in terms of research themes, formats, and platforms. We are delighted to welcome our participants joining us in the safety of their homes through Facebook and YouTube live streaming. The 8PKSS is co-organized by the UP Korean Research Center and the UP Department of Linguistics and sponsored by the Korea, the Korea Foundation. On April 27, 2016, the University of the Philippines launched the Korea Research Center with the support of the Acad Academy of Korean Studies, or AKS, Korean Studies Promotion Service, aiming to provide Filipino scholars and researchers with opportunities to widen their interest in Korean studies. The center hopes to be a venue for students and professionals to produce meaningful comparative research and to promote collaborative partnerships among Korean and Philippine institutions. The center serves as a university-wide hub that helps promote and develop Korean studies in the university and uh, the country. It sponsors interdisciplinary and intercollege research and educational activities on Korea studies, as well as facilitates the training of the next generation of Koreanists in the country. The UP Department of Linguistics is an academic institution under the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, which is distincti distinctly focused on the scientific study, preservation, and promotion of Philippine languages and dialects through teaching, archiving, research, and publication. It is also mandated to use its research expertise to address language issues in the country. Aside from the Philippine linguistics, the department is also recognized as an expert in the teaching of the national languages of Asia. It is designated as a center of excellence of foreign, uh, in foreign languages by the Philippines Commission on Higher Education. This year's installment of the PKSS is also being conducted in celebration of the centennial founding anniversary of the Department of Linguistics. We also wish to thank our followers and supporters and to express our gratitude in making events such as this happen. We wish to greet everyone and hope all will have fruitful learning experience today and in the next two days of the symposium. And for our house rules, before we begin our program, we would like to remind our viewers of some house rules. You may send your questions and comments to our panelists throughout the event in the comment section of the Facebook and YouTube live streaming. The questions and comments will then be read during the open forum and will be addressed by our guest speakers. We are also reminded that the whole forum is a safe space and thus will not tolerate any form of bullying and trolling, academic or otherwise. The organizer reserves the right to remove those who will create any disruption in any part of the program. And to those who of you who are turned in live or who just tuned in live, you may claim your certificate of attendance after you have accomplished the evaluation form, the link of which will be provided throughout the session. The Google form will be open until 5 p.m. today, January 28, 2023. We would like also to inform you that this event will be recorded and uploaded to the official UP KRC Facebook page and YouTube channel. Okay, so I think everyone is excited for today. So before we begin the first keynote speech, let us get to know our speaker. Our first keynote speaker is the Dean of the Graduate School of International Studies, or GSIS, of Sogang University, Dr. Kim Chetsun. Dr. Kim is a professor of international relations at the Graduate School of International Studies, at Sogang University and currently Dean for Sogang GSIS. He is a political scientist trained at Yale University, 
with a degree in Masters of Arts in Master of Arts in International Relations and PhD in Political Science. Before joining Sogang, he worked at Yale University as a lecturer for the Department of Political Science and Yale Center for the International and Area Studies. And to deliver his keynote speech titled The Future of International Order of uh, and U.S.-China competition. Let us all welcome Dr. Kim Chechen. Whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, uh, Professor J.L. Igno. Uh, it's really uh, glad to, to deliver this uh, special lecture to all of you uh, in the Philippines, although it's, uh, it's online. Uh, I am very glad to, to uh, meet uh, uh, each and every one of you, uh, although it's uh, uh, it's it's online. It's a, it's a virtual meeting, but I, I am very much happy to to uh, take a part in this important venue. Uh, some five years ago, I was in the venue, uh, and I have all the good memories about you know participating in this very very important uh, venue. Uh, to today, I'll, I'll be talking about. The, the future of international relations and how it is related to uh, escalating rivalry between the United States and then China or China and the United States. So uh, without you know much ado, let's begin. Um, when you when you think about the future of international order or future of international relations, if you will, uh, what, what comes to your mind uh, when, when you think about the future of international order? Uh, what vocabulary uh, comes to your mind? I, I'll just let that question sink in for about three seconds. Think about it. Well, to me, uh, when I think about the future of international order, uh, the following vocabularies enter my mind immediately. Decoupling um, or disconnectedness, disintegration. Um, or oh, what is decoupling? Uh, decoupling is rather well-defined vocabulary uh, in the field of economics. You know, the decoupling denotes the, the situation Oh, where the uh, economies of countries are being disconnected from, from one another, okay? But in the field of, in the field of international relations, uh, we, we define decoupling in rather broader sense. You know, we, we mean decoupling not just in the field of economics, but also in the field of politics in the field of security and also in the field of security. Uh, so ba basically uh, decoupling means the end of globalization to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, sorry, I had to turn off the, the heater. <laughs> um, so uh, first thing first, uh, what, what was Globalization. Well, what is globalization? If, if you believe uh, globalization is uh, still an ongoing phenomenon, what, what do you think is, is globalization? You know, globalization was one of the most hardly debated issues in past decades. There are both, you know, ardent proponents and then extreme opponents to globalization. Uh, I think uh, the term globalization entered the uh, scholarly jargon in the 1980s, but without really a clear uh, definition. Uh, to some people, globalization means integration of economies. But to others, to political scientists like, like myself, uh, globalization also means integration in the area of politics, integration in the area of culture, uh, free flow of people, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, globalization, uh, how how do I remove this this part? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, 
So globalization was integration, decoupling, uh, connectedness, and so on and so forth. Sorry about the confusion. Okay. And many people, many scholars tend to agree that that era of coupling, that era of integration, or that era of connectedness is basically coming to an end. What we are witnessing now, or in any foreseeable future, is the end of globalization. And now we are entering the era of the globalization. Now, when the Cold War was over in late 1980s, or early 1990s, there was this uh, sense of optimism or you know, a sense of euphoria, if you will. And one of these, these optimists was this professor by the name of Francis Fukuyama uh, in his very famous book, The End of History and the Last Man. He basically declared the victory for liberalism, liberal economic principle and also liberal political ideology, if you will. Uh, Fukuyama in that famous book said, you know, we, we can basically define history as a struggle about with which principle will be organizing politics and economy within the states and also across the states. You know, basically we can define history as a struggle about with which ideology we should be organizing politics and economy in nation states and also internationally, in, in, in international uh, relations. And he claims that with the end of the Cold War, this definition of history is pretty much over. Why, why is that? Because liberalism, as I said, liberal political ideology and liberal economic ideology won that, that debate uh, big time. Hence, the end of history as, as we know it. Uh, he claims that there is no viable alternative to liberal democracy, and there is no viable alternative to capitalist market economy. He conceded that these two institutions, liberal democratic institutions, liberal economic institutions, they are not perfect. However, there are no viable alternatives. You know, communism is no viable alternative. Socialism is no viable alternative to liberal democracy or capitalist market economy. Um, of course, he said that, that we, we, we don't really uh, enter the era of perpetual peace. There is going to be, as long as human beings live on, there will be conflicts. Okay, and there will be wars. Sure, uh, you know, uh, you know, the end of the Cold War doesn't necessarily mean the arrival of perpetual peace. However, uh, liberalism or rules-based liberal international order uh, is here to stay uh, for a long time, or, or uh, perpetually, basically. Uh, he was very optimistic about the future of international relations, international order based on liberalism. You know, he was very optimistic about the future of rules-based liberal international order. Uh, and he sort of predicted that non-democratic countries like China would eventually become democratic country. And uh, we all know that this view sort of affected uh, policies toward China in the United States. Another globalization optimist, I'm pretty sure that you heard about uh, his name, Thomas Friedman, uh, who is a, a very famous columnist for the New York Times. Uh, he uh, is one of the uh, prom prominent globalization optimists, uh, and he claimed that globalization will benefit uh, virtually uh, every country that participates uh, in globalization. And uh, this has something to do with the development in, in technologies. Technologies uh, 
in the area of information and communication technology, transportation, and all these new institutions. Uh, because of, of developments uh, in, in these technologies, capital, commodities, and services will free, freely move across borders. And, you know, borders would mean less. And then people will uh, freely, uh, uh, you know, move around, uh, you know, regardless of the borders. Uh, so the outcome, the end outcome of this uh, globalization is, you know, tight integration, tight uh, coupling, if you will. And overall, this is going to be very beneficial to the states, farms, and people all around the world. I mean, as long as you, you participate in globalization. And, and, and since uh, the end outcome of globalization, the end outcome of participating in globalization is beneficial, and more and more countries will, will realize this, and they will uh, jump in, into the uh, globalization. Uh, they, will, they will be a jump on the uh, globalization bandwagon. So uh, basically more countries, firms, and people will participate in globalization uh, eventually. Um, and uh, if you participate in globalization, you'll have to liberalize your economies. So uh, economic liberalization, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, phenomenon that took place in, in China to participate in globalization, they sort of uh, liberalized their economies. Uh, not perfectly, but they, they did uh, liberalize the economies. And if you liberalize your economies, this will eventually lead to political liberalization, some sort of opening in the area of politics. Uh, but that didn't really uh, uh, come to fruition. Uh, you know, that, that, uh, that scheme that economic liberalization would eventually lead to political liberalization uh, didn't really uh, take place in, in China. Uh, important prediction made by Thomas Friedman was that because of the advance of globalization, uh, you know, borders would mean less and geography would mean less and less. So uh, importance of geopolitics will decline because of the uh, advance of globalization. What is geopolitics, by the way? What is geopolitics? You know, geopolitics studies geography and how this geography, geographical location of certain countries affect their foreign policy making. You know, for instance, you know, Ukraine and also South Korea, uh, these two countries are uh, the most representative, what they call in-between countries, you know, Ukraine and, and South Korea. Korea as a whole uh, surrounded by great powers. This geographical location of two countries pretty much define a uh, foreign policy environment for, for these two countries. You know, they uh, basically uh, affect foreign policy making of, of these two countries. So geopolitics basically studies how geography and geo or geographical location of certain countries affect international relations surrounding those two countries. And because of advance of, of globalization, uh, geopolitics, the importance of geopolitics will be on, on the decline. They will be uh, declining. Uh, why? Because of globalization, world is pretty much becoming flat. You know, that's uh, the, one of the title of one of his, his uh, very, very famous books. The world is flat. Okay. However, uh, beginning early 2010s, uh, some, skeptic, some skeptics uh, began to challenge these optimistic views advanced by, say, Thomas Friedman or Francis Fukuyama. Uh, well, one of the uh, scholars readily uh, entered my mind, uh, you know, this person by the name of uh, Robert Kaplan uh, in his book, uh, Revenge of Geography, Revenge of Geography. So geography, basically uh, the, the, the message that he, he wanted to impart uh, in this book is that geography is still very much valid, you know, very much uh, important. Uh, so uh, world is still very much 
uh, convoluted. It's, it's not flat. You know, world is not flat. A uh, world is very much uh, convoluted because of the importance of geography and, and geopolitics. Okay. And Peter Zaihan, uh, he's a geopolitician, a person who studies geopolitics. I very much enjoy reading his books in, in recent months. Uh, I'm going to introduce two books written by Peter Zayan. Uh, the, the first book is, is the most recent book written by Peter Zayan is titled The End of the World is Just the Beginning. Uh, in this book, uh, he claims that, you know, this uh, era of globalization, you know, past 70 some years, I mean, he defines, I mean, he, he says that globalization began uh, when the Cold War, I'm sorry, when, when the World War II was over, okay? And this globalization, this this phenomenon, this global phenomenon was basically uh, sort of manufactured uh, by the uh, U.S. hegemonic power, okay? Anyways, past 70 some years have been the most prosperous period in world history. And this has been, this was really quite exceptional because these past 70 years uh, have been the most prosperous uh, period in, in the world history. And this is basically unprecedented in, in the world history. However, the party is pretty much over, okay? Uh, it's over. Uh, so it's the end of the world, but the end of the world is just the beginning, as a matter of fact. Why is that? I mean, by the way, uh, he he uh, titled his book, the title of his book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, was taken after the famous saying by Winston Churchill in 1942. You know, in 1942, the Allies, the Allies won a very important victory in African theater, in, in North Africa, there was this epic battle uh, between, you know, General Patton and General Rommel, you know, Rommel, we, we call him Rommel in South Korea, uh, you know, Rommel from Germany. So there was this a very, very important battle in North African theater of operation. And uh, basically for the first time, the Allies won very, very important victory uh, in 1942 uh, in African theater. So uh, his close confidantes were saying that, uh, Mr. Churchill, we won this very, very important battle. So now we can relax, uh, let's have a party, uh, let's relax for a while. But uh, you know, Churchill was saying that, you know, don't be too happy now. Uh, it's, it's too early to celebrate, you know, now, this is not really the end. You know, this this victory uh, in African theater of operation is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Okay? So we got a long struggle uh, ahead of us. That's what he meant by saying this. And... Zion is saying that well, the end of the world, it feels like it's the end of the world. Why? Because globalization is, is, is coming to an end. And, but sorry, uh, the end of the world is just the beginning. You know, we, we had very, we, we've gone through very difficult times because of COVID. Uh, you know, the world was hit hard by COVID uh, in early 2019, I believe. A Ukrainian war, soaring energy crisis, you know, soaring inflation rate, and so on and so forth. But this is just the beginning, you know. So uh, be prepared uh, for the worst uh, that is coming ahead. So that's the, the message that he's trying to impart in, in this book. Uh, and he basically claims that the end of, of uh, the era of globalization is, is over. And uh, wh why is that? Uh, in this very uh, interesting book titled "The End of Superpower," uh, the I'm sorry, uh, "The Accidental Superpower," which was published in 2016, uh, we are witnessing the end of globalization. And one of the reasons is the U.S. foreign policy isolationism. U.S. foreign policy has become very much isolationist. You know, uh, 
the U.S. Uh, hegemonic power was the one of the reasons why the globalization uh, took place in the fir first place. And uh, the U U.S. pretty much maintained uh, globalization, uh, the order of globalization. But now uh, the U.S. foreign policy has become very much isolationist. There is a lack of will. Uh, there is uh, also capability to lead the world is in decline. Okay, um, I don't think I have time to to talk about uh, the U.S. foreign policy making. But uh, important thing is that before the end of of World War II, the U.S. foreign policy had been virtually isolationist, isolationist for a very long time. Uh, it was only after the end of the World War II did the U.S. adopt a uh, very activist or internationalist foreign policy. But it is coming to an end. It is coming to an end. You know, the, one of the reasons, the reason that the U.S. became, U.S. foreign policy became internationalist uh, was, was accidental. You know, the U.S. never really intended to become a superpower country from the very beginning, okay, because the U.S., is 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 the security is, is is pretty much guaranteed because the U.S. is, is surrounded by two oceans, and then two very friendly neighbors. In north they have Canada, you know. In, in the south they have Mexico. They don't really pose any uh, security threats. So the situation is very much different from European countries uh, that are bordering with uh, these hideous or very hostile neighbors. Okay, so they never really wanted to get get entangled in in foreign policy. They basically thought that they could be pretty much on their own. However, they became very, very activist, very much uh, internationalist foreign policy maker after the end of the World War II. Okay, so therefore, uh, the U.S. ascent to superpower status is pretty much accidental because uh, of World War II and previously World War One. Okay, I, I really don't think uh, we have time to talk about the uh, the history of U.S. foreign policy. So, anyways, uh, the uh, it's, it's the U.S. that pretty much created uh, globalization uh, after the end of the World War II. U U.S. Uh, created uh, Bretton Woods uh, monetary system or Bretton Woods international free international economic system. You know this free international economic order. Uh, in the area of trade and also in the area of monetary uh, policy as well. And, and this pretty much laid a foundation for globalization uh, in the 50s or 60s, 70s, and well into the 80s and then 90s. Um, and this was a, a international public goods created by the United States, American hegemonic power. Uh, and you know, this order was was possible because of American security guarantee. Uh, other countries basically uh, did free riding. Countries like uh, Germany, back then it was West Germany, Japan, also South Korea, you know, so-called East Asian uh, tigers, South Korea, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, they all did free riding, okay? Um, and uh, one of the important uh, phenomena of globalization is this emergence of global value chain or global supply chain. But now uh, this global supply chain is, is crumbling down. You know, global value chain is being disintegrated. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that the U.S. is no longer interested in, in managing, uh, you know, global supply chain or global international order. Rather, they want to dismantle, they're trying to sort of dismantle global supply chain and trying to uh, expel China uh, from this global supply chain. Uh, not all areas of economic policies, but in these important strategic industries such as uh, semiconductor industry, uh, electric vehicle, particularly uh, lithium battery, rare earth soil, 
uh, information and, and, and communication technology, and also AI. Uh, the, the, it's uh, the U.S. Uh, they uh, th there is trying to uh, decouple uh, China from these important strategic industries. Okay. Um, you go to the U.S. Yeah, I went to the U.S. Uh, last year in, in November and stayed there for two weeks. Uh, the, the national mood is, is rather uh, different from uh, that of, say, uh, 2000s or 2010s. As, I mean, the, the national mood has become very much uh, inward looking. Um, I, I, you know, they, they, they uh, American public, they, they want to they want their government to reorganize national priorities. You know, they, they are saying that, well, the American government will have to uh, pay more attention to uh, domestic problems uh, rather than paying attention to uh, these seemingly intractable uh, international issues in, in the Middle East, uh, in Syrian war, uh, war in Afghanistan, Sure, uh, it is important to to resolve those civil conflicts in in Syria and in Afghanistan. But you know we are also suffering here in the United States. It has something to do with the uh, globalization. You know these globalization optimists, uh, Thomas Friedman, uh, Francis Fukuyama. They they were saying all along that well, first what we need to do is to create this big pizza or big pie and make pie bigger. And eventually, the, the greater wealth will trickle down to the lower strata of the society. But that didn't place. That didn't take. A, that didn't really happen. Uh, what really happened in the U.S. is because of globalization, all these manufacturing jobs they left the United States, uh, and uh, you go to these uh, Midwest states uh, in the states of Ohio. Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, factories are not operating anymore. You know, uh, these belts are all rusty, hence the term rust belt states. The states in, in Ohio, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, why did the U.S. foreign policy making uh, become very much isolation? It has something to do with the uh, the uh, globalization because uh, trickle down didn't really happen, and uh, and these um, middle class people and uh, working class people uh, they were suffering. But interestingly, uh, American establishment. Uh, you know, Washington D.C. Uh, people uh, in in policymaking circle didn't really reali realize that there is a, a sea change in in national in mood. Uh, all these sentiments shared by uh, working class people and uh, the middle class people has something to do with the uh, war in Iraq. Uh, you know, it was a fiasco because war uh, went on for nearly ten years uh, without producing any uh, substantial policy outcomes it has something to do with the uh, 2008 financial crisis uh, it had to do you know so all, all these uh, incidents uh, produce this this inward looking national mood in the United States that's one of the reasons why the US foreign policy making has become very much isolationist uh, the sea change this uh, national mood you know as I said the Washington establishment people didn't really know this structural change in American society but Donald Trump sort of did he knew this uh, sea change in, in national mood it's one of the reasons why he he sort of exploited that uh, uh, national mood in the United States and that's uh, you know exactly the reason why he won the uh, presidential election in 2016. Uh, I, I think uh, Trumpism is here to stay. Uh, sure, he was very much weakened by uh, after the U.S. midterm election in last year. Uh, so his political standing is very much weakened. However, 
Trumpism is still very much well and alive. Uh, and I, I believe that Biden is, is also being affected by this national vote. And he's, his policy is very much, uh, you know, Trumpian, uh, except for, uh, uh, you know, I can think of some exceptions, uh, exceptions including uh, his policy toward the allies and uh, his uh, v value uh, based uh, foreign policy. However, when he came to South Korea in 2022 in, in May, uh, his visit to South Korea was all about how he can sort of uh, induce South Korean conglomerates like uh, Samsung Electronics or Hyundai Motors, you know, sort of uh, convince them to invest more in the United States, convince them to build more factories, these big plants uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, Samsung Electronics uh, chairperson E. J. L. promised that, that that he would build, uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, big plants. You know, semiconductor uh, plants uh, in the United States, and so did uh, uh, Honda Motors chairperson. Um, it's it's all all, all about really uh, America first. I mean, this uh, important piece of legislation, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. If you look deeper into the contents of Inflation Reduction Act, you know this uh, uh, landmark legislation by the President Joe Biden. Uh, but if you look deeper into the contents, it's it's really all about how uh, you know you you want to make America great again. Uh, so uh, that America firstism is still very much well alive uh, under the Joe Biden administration. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of agree with uh, Peter Zion uh, on the point that one of the reasons for deglobalization and decoupling, uh, for that matter, has something to do with the uh, relative decline of the United States. I said relative because the U.S. also uh, grew. Uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. Uh, GDP grew. Uh, however, be because uh, China grew faster, a lot faster, I think we can say that the U.S. has been in relative decline in past couple of decades. However, uh, for, ver for a variety of reasons, uh, I mean, this is how I see uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy making has become very much uh, less internationalist. Uh, this, therefore, uh, the U.S. Joe Biden administration wants uh, key allies. In, in Asia and also uh, in Europe to shoulder more of a burden uh, in maintaining uh, rules-based international order or globalization, uh, if you will. Uh, the U.S. has become less enthusiastic uh, about uh, the, their sort of duty to uh, maintain international order, although Joe Biden is saying that, well, he's very much into the task of leading the world, but I, I'm not really sure whether Joe Biden is up to that task. Uh, we, we can talk about that more uh, in in a coming questions answers session. Um, and some other reasons for decoupling uh, include well, COVID-19. We all know that uh, COVID-19 is one of the most important uh, human security issues which require all countries in the world to cooperate more closely. However, what happened was decoupling of policies. I mean, Chinese and Americans, Americans and Chinese were saying that, well, this is uh, one area where we can cooperate, you know, how we can fight uh, together against the spread of COVID-19. But that didn't happen. That didn't really happen. Mm -hmm they actually weaponized their vaccines. You know, uh, Chinese were, were splashing their vaccines in, in Latin America, in Latin America, sort of uh, to befriend, uh, you know, people in Latin America. And also, uh, Americans also weaponized their vaccines, uh, blaming each other uh, for the origin of uh, COVID-19. So this is one uh, issue area where uh, two 
great powers should have stepped up and to uh, have cooperated more proactively, but that didn't happen. Okay, so COVID nineteen actually ended up in in uh, decoupling the uh, world order more intensely. Uh, you know, Ukrainian war also it was like uh, Russians uh, opting out of this globalized international order. Uh, Russia, I believe, is is going to be permanently ostracized in in internationally. Okay. Ukrainian war is well, one other reason why we are entering uh, the era of decoupling. Uh, it's uh, putting a lot of strains on, on you know, global supply chain in, in energy, uh, global supply chain uh, in uh, uh, food supplies, and so on and so forth. And uh, as I said, the limits of globalization itself. Uh, you know, it's there, there was uh, some you know, limitations to globalization, unlike what uh, globalization optimists promised, that didn't really happen. Uh, you know, as I said uh, a couple of times, a trickle down didn't really take place. And, uh, you know, rich got richer and the poor got poorer. Uh, the end, and the end, of, and the, uh, and outcome of which is the rise of extreme populism in the US, in Europe, and also in Latin America, virtually all around the world. And also, uh, decoupling or deglobalization has uh, a lot to do with the uh, intensification of the US China uh, great power rivalry. Okay, uh, we, we will be talking more about that. Uh, for uh, yeah, I think I'm I'm doing. Am I doing okay with my time? I I hope uh, I'm doing okay with uh, with timing here. Um, so pretty much, uh, many scholars agree that uh, globalization, deglobalization, or decoupling is, is taking place. Uh, but there is also a debate as to whether this is going to be a complete decoupling or a rather, you know, rapid deglobalization. Uh, there, there are uh, divergent views as to how rapidly we are entering the era of deglobalization uh, or whether decoupling is going to be a, a sweeping decoupling, say, uh, between the U.S. and in China. Uh, is the complete decoupling between the U.S. economy and, and Chinese economy? There are some debates. Ian Bremer, uh, who I also enjoy, uh, you know, listening to on these podcasts, uh, you know, he's also a geopolitician. He studies geopolitics, and he's the president and the founder of Eurasia Group. Uh, he and Peter Zion, they are very uh, close friends. Uh, and uh, Ian Bremer is saying that, well, deglobalization is happening, but very slowly. And uh, many areas of coupling, say uh, China-US uh, economic interdependence, they will remain interdependent. Their economies will remain interdependent in large part. However, the coupling is, is taking place in the area of semiconductor industry, pharmaceutical, AI, you know, ICT information and the communications technology, and uh, rare soil, so on and so forth. However, uh, they will remain coupled in many other uh, important economic uh, areas. Okay, so he's basically saying that, hey, Peter Zion, uh, you are right. Uh, you are right saying that we are entering the end of globalization, but you are being a little bit too extreme here, saying that, well, the end of the world is just beginning and it's going to be really disastrous because the uh, U.S. Is, is backing down. But I, I don't believe that way. I, I don't believe so. Uh, the U.S. is up to the task and, uh, and the U.S., uh, despite what they are saying, uh, there's not going to be a complete decoupling because they do understand that uh, remaining 
coupled with the Chinese economy is very, very important for, for the uh, U.S. economy as well. However, uh, uh, Peter Zayan and Ewan Bremer, they all agree that intensification of the U.S.-China great power rivalry is uh, one of these factors that is contributing to the uh, decoupling, deglobalization, disintegration. So let, let's take a look at the nature of the U.S.-China competition. Now, many scholars compare U.S.-China rivalry to old Cold War. I mean, this is new Cold War. I mean, the, uh, the, the rivalry between the U.S. and China, we can call it new Cold War. So is the competition between the U.S. and China a new Cold War? So let, let's think about some of the similarities and differences between the old Cold War and new Cold War here. Uh, if it really, uh, we can call it Cold War, a new Cold War. Uh, what, what are the similarities? Uh, first similarity is that they all entail, you know, old Cold War and new Cold War, they all entail geopolitical competition for the sphere of influence. You know, great powers, they, they want sphere of influence. So there is a competition for sphere of influence geopolitically. I mean, back in the days of old Cold War, the Soviet Union and the US, they, there was a competition uh, for the sphere of influence and the competition was over Europe, basically. Europe was the most important uh, region of the world. But now uh, the new Cold War, the competition, geopolitical competition is over this uh, Indo-Pacific region okay and also uh you know as with the co old cold war this new cold war thing is about ideological competition as well you know like uh former soviet union uh that had this uh, uh messianic mission to export communism worldwide uh, I, I don't think china has that uh you know messianic mission to export uh, Chinese model of politics and economy all around the world. But however, I do believe that China uh, is, is presenting their political model and their economic model as a, a viable alternative to uh, liberal political model and economic political model. So there is a uh, uh, ideological uh, dimension of competition in this new Cold War as well. And uh, we, we are also, as with the uh, old Cold War, uh, we are witnessing emergence of uh, several blocks, uh, you know, uh, bifurcation of the international order. Uh, on the one hand, we, we are witnessing a uh, a coalition of of these uh, revisionist countries, you know, these countries that aren't really happy with the uh, the existing international order, uh, China, Russia, and also North Korea, uh, Iran, and some other countries. They are not really happy with the existing international order, sort of established and maintained by the United States. Okay, so they want to sort of revise these international orders uh, to their liking. Uh, so they, they are getting closer to each other. So we are uh, witnessing uh, e emergence of uh, one coalition in the countries such as China, Russia, and North Korea, Iran, so on and so forth. And all these status quo oriented countries such as the US, uh, European countries, in, you know, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and some other uh, status quo-oriented countries, they are also sort of uh, getting closer to each other and then trying to present a unified front against the other camp. Uh, and there are some other countries that are, why well, India, I believe, is still, uh, I believe, an in-between country and is still 
trying to see uh, where the wind is blowing. Uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, they they are uh, sort of uh, sitting uh, in between. So uh, yeah, there are certain similarities between the old Cold War and uh, new Cold War. Uh, the main difference, I believe, is that during the old Cold War era, the U.S. and former Soviet Union, they were completely disconnected economically. And the former Soviet Union wasn't really an important actor in the world economy. Uh, so there wasn't really a, a geo-economic competition between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. There was no geo-economic competition between the United States and the former Soviet Union. Okay. However, in this era of new Cold War, because uh, economies of, of great, uh, the U.S. And, and China are heavily intertwined with each other, and then China is and still uh, and, and will, be, will remain as a very, very important actor in the world economy, uh, I think this is uh, uh, the thing that is making the nature of, of, of a competition very complicated very complicated uh, because of the uh, of uh, economic interdependence and uh, uh, and because the, the two economies are heavily intertwined with each other uh, technology or economic competition has become very very important hence the term techno political competition or techno economic competition and uh, economic war or a techno technological war between the two countries has become probably uh, one of the most important aspects of competition but but today uh if uh i'm allowed to to talk for uh some 50 more minutes i, I like to talk about geopolitical competition geopolitical competition geopolitical dimension of the uh, U.S.-China competition, and as I said, uh, that geopolitical competition is taking place over in the Pacific region, um, and uh, that competition, geopolitical competition, has also something to do with the uh, disconnectedness or disintegration that I, you know, the, the concept or the vocabulary that I. Uh, threw in uh, in the beginning of uh, today's lecture uh, because the ascent of this this concept of new region in the Pacific because you know previously uh, we didn't really talk about in the Pacific the more dominant concept of region in Asia used to be Asia Pacific not in the Pacific so this is a sort of a new thing new concept concept of region and also concept of, of strategy. Uh, and uh, why did this new concept of region come into existence? Because I, I, I believe it has something to do, it actually has a lot to do with the growing strategic importance of Indian Ocean. You know, if, if you look at the map here, uh, I mean, this in Indian Ocean is the the ocean or region uh, where three important straits, you know, three great straits are located. Uh, Bab el Mandeb Strait here. Uh, this is Red Sea, and this is Gulf of Aden, and this is Bab el Mandeb Strait. And of course, this is a uh, uh, probably the most important strait in the world. Uh, you know, Hormuz. Strait and also uh, Malacca Strait here. Uh, so uh, the Indian Ocean uh, is is very very important, and particularly a Hormuz Strait here and Malacca uh, Strait down here. Uh, from the perspective of military strategy, they they are two important choke points. If we, if you choke these two points. Uh, say because the U.S. still has uh, hegemonic status uh, in this ocean, Indian Ocean, and uh, over uh, Hormuz Strait and, and Malacca Strait. If if you choke these these two important points, 
uh, if you blockade these these two straits, that it'll paralyze uh, uh, Chinese economy. Uh, it, it'll paralyze not just Chinese economy, but also Chinese uh, strategy uh, as a whole. Um, so it's a very, very important uh, ocean, and it's where uh, sea lane of communication is, you know, important sea lanes of communication is, is located. Uh, Hormuz and Malacca, very, very important choke points from the perspective of military strategy. So the reason why uh, this, uh, you know, naval strategist, Alfred Thayer Mahan, once said that whoever controls the Indian Ocean will control uh, Asia and basically will dominate the world. You, you gotta have control over the Indian Ocean. Okay. Um, you know, previously, Indian Ocean was under the control of the US hegemonic power. In the post World War II era, uh, Indian Ocean was under the control of the US hegemonic power. And uh, there is this, you know, Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean. Two oceans were sort of connected under the uh, U.S. hegemonic power. Uh, militarily, uh, American you know, Central Command in, in Europe and American Pacific Command in, in, in Asia, uh, they were able to maintain connectedness uh, between Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. However, because of the rise of China, uh, the story has become very different. You know, uh, as with uh, many other countries, you know, particularly South Korea and Japan, uh, Chinese oil imports, 80% of them uh, flows through Hormuz. From Hormuz, Indian Ocean, to Malacca Strait, South China Sea, and to China, 80% of oil imports. So from the perspective of China, it's very, very important to safeguard these sea lanes of, of communication. Uh, what, what if uh, the US uh, blockade those two important choke points, you know, Hormuz and Malacca Strait with their existing hegemonic power? It's going to paralyze Chinese economy. It's, it's going to uh, paralyze Chinese national strategy as, as a whole. So beginning 2010, uh, China has tried to establish sort of exclusive military control over the Indian Ocean, dispatching naval vessels to the region and, you know, to the uh, uh, Bay of Aden uh, and uh, tr they try to establish naval bases. Uh, and that led to a string of poor strategy So sorry, this is in, in Korean, but this is China's string of pearl strategy, trying to uh, establish naval vessels in Kota Kinabalu in Malaysia, Xianokbil in Cambodia, Shitwe in Myanmar, Chittagong in Bangladesh, Colombo in Sri Lanka, Maldives. And in 2018, I think uh, uh, China uh, made a deal with uh, Pakistanis uh, to lease this important port of Gwadar, uh, basically uh, permanently. And it, in 2020, they established this uh, military base uh, in the port of Obok in this country, a very, very important uh, strategic country uh, in, in North Africa, Djibouti, uh, for the far, first time in the history, China established military base uh, on foreign soil. Uh, I think that's uh, in 2022. So this is a uh, uh, string of the pearl strategy. And in the eyes of these so-called the status quo-oriented countries in the region, in the eyes of Indians and also Australia, Australians here and, and, and Japan and also the United States, this is quite threatening. This is really uh, endangering connectedness uh, between the two oceans, Indian Ocean and, and, and Pacific Ocean. You know, connectedness between these two oceans uh, was taken for granted uh, in post-World War II era. However, 
uh, this connectedness is, 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 is being endangered because of, of China's policy to establish rather exclusive military control over the uh, Indian Ocean. Okay. Uh, and if you take a look at our uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, this maritime Silk Road is to exert a rather exclusive influence in Indian Ocean. You know, this uh, maritime Silk Road component of China's Belt and Road Initiative is to have rather exclusive control over the Indian Ocean here. Uh, so this is uh, important oil shipping lane, you know, sea lines of communication here. And this is uh, basically this line sort of denotes uh, China's strategy of string of poles here. Okay. And uh, in the eyes of the status quo countries, such as, you know, India, uh, Australia, Japan, and the United States, so-called uh, quote countries, quote countries, you know, quadrilateral. Uh, they, they are thinking that well, Ch Chinese policy to establish rather exclusive control over the Indian Ocean is threatening connectedness of the two oceans. So they began talking about the importance of, of maritime cooperation over the Indian Ocean and how it is important to secure maritime security in the Indian Ocean. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, in the Pacific that new concept of the region came into existence in the first place. You know, So I, I think it is very important for you to understand in the Pacific, not as a concept of strategy, but as a concept of region. Uh, the new geopolitical concept of region that came into existence uh, because of the uh, ascent of China, rise of China, and China's rather aggressive policy to establish uh, rather exclusive uh, military control over the Indian Ocean. I mean, from the perspective of Chinese, I, I think it's quite understandable because uh, now they are competing with the United States. Uh, over this region and uh, they have to worry about the situation where the US can uh, blockade those two important choke points, uh, you know, Hormuz, Hormuz Strait and, and, and Malacca Strait. Uh, so it's one of the reasons why they are trying to, you know, establish uh, control over the Indian Ocean, but that uh, in and of itself is, is, is making these status quo countries in the region think that, well, we got to do something. You know, we have to cooperate more closely to maintain connectedness of these two important regions. So that, I think, is the reason why this uh, new concept of region came into existence. And, you know, this a concept of region in Asia has been always in, full, in, you know, in flux. Uh, several years ago, no one really talked about, I mean, of course, I mean, 10 years ago, when I went to Australia for this conference, for this seminar hosted by a Lowy Institute in Australia, uh, these Indian scholars there, and, and particularly Australian scholars were casually talking about in the Pacific, in the Pacific, and saying that, well, this concept of region will be replacing existing concept of region in Asia, which is Asia Pacific. Uh, in, in 10 years down the road, there's going to be a new concept of region. I was very skeptical, as a matter of fact, because, uh, you know, to me, uh, Asia Pacific sounded really comfortable. Uh, so I, I was very skeptical when they said that this concept of a region, new concept of region in the Pacific will be replacing uh, existing concept of region uh, that is uh, Asia Pacific. That's exactly what is happening now. That's exactly. I, I, I think uh, the Indo-Pacific is replacing, this concept of region is replacing the uh, existing concept of region uh, in, in very rapid manner. Okay? And that sort of reflects the uh, importance of, of 
importance of Rimland. I mean, uh, these geopolitical strategists, uh, Halford Mackinder, Mackinder back in 1904. So uh, when you think about geopolitical strategy, a most important region is these heartlands, heartland or high sea. Uh, whereas in 1942, uh, Yale historian Nicholas Spikeman sort of uh, revised that uh, geopolitical theory. Uh, you know, if you go look at the map, you know, uh, basically uh, Halford Mackinder was saying there were two sort of uh, uh, control the world. I mean, to maintain hegemonic status, it is very important for you to have uh, to exert control over the heartland and the high sea here in the Pacific Ocean, high sea there in the Atlantic Ocean. But uh, Spikeman, uh, Nicholas Spikeman was saying that, well, more important region of the world, I mean, as long as geopolitical competition is this concern, are these inshores, inshores, so-called Asian Mediterranean or, or uh, Rimland. Uh, so they, they are more important. Rimland is more important and inshore rather than high sea is, is more important in terms of geopolitical competition. I, I think uh, Nicholas Spikeman is, is right. He's, I mean, I'm not saying that he's right, but he's more relevant in this era of uh, in the Pacific. And uh, and as a region, as a region, uh, I, yeah, I like to emphasize that uh, the, the, the reason that this new concept of, of region came into existence is this consensus shared by the uh, status quo oriented countries that that we will have to maintain connectedness between these two oceans, two important oceans. Okay, so uh, that led to the uh, advent, uh, ascent of this new concept of region that is in the Pacific, and uh, in the Pacific has also become a uh, strategy uh, for the U.S., not just for the U.S. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, it is Japan, it was Japan, Shinjo Abe, who came up with this uh, new concept of strategy, so-called uh, FOIP, Free and Open in the Pacific, in, in 2016. He was the first person. So Japan was the first to uh, came up with uh, in the Pacific strategy, and, and he sort of sold uh, that strategy to the Americans, to uh, Donald Trump, who scrapped Obama's uh, strategy of pivot to Asia, uh, rebalancing strategy. Okay. And uh, if you take a, if you think of Indo-Pacific as a one region, one connected region, it really is the most important region in the world. It has a great potential. As of now, 60% of world's population lives in the region. And 60% of uh, GDP is being produced in the region. And by 2030, it is expected that 90% of the new middle class will be residing in, in the Pacific region. And it is also a very, very important region in the world because it also has uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, so, you know, if you want to uh, obtain uh, UN uh, sustainable development goals, I mean, this is the, the region that you have to pay attention to. So this is a very, very important region in the world. And that I think is the reason why not just the US or the Quad countries, but also many European countries, Great Britain, Germany, Netherlands, and also EU uh, came up with their own Indo-Pacific strategies, you know, uh, in and also ASEAN countries. ASEAN also came up with uh, it's not really strategy, but AOIP, ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you already heard of that term. And uh, 
about a month ago, uh, South Korea also uh, showcased uh, its own version of uh, of Indo-Pacific strategy. And uh, two months ago, uh, Canadians also uh, came up with uh, their own Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, it's not just uh, you know these countries all came up with their own Indo-Pacific strategy. It's, it's not because they want to uh, bandwagon with uh, uh, Americans. But they they believe that 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 this region is very very important, and their biggest concern is how we can maintain connectedness uh, between the two oceans, how we can uh, secure openness and uh, and and uh, yeah connectedness or connectivity uh, in in the region is, is the the reason why all the all these other countries. Uh, trying to engage more uh, proactively in the region with their own uh, strategic frameworks. Sure, uh, you know, America in the Pacific strategy and uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, they are uh, competing with each other. So there is a, uh, a overlap between uh, two strategic frameworks of, of these two superpower countries, China's Belt and Road Initiative and uh, and and the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy envisioned by Japan and the United States. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide. So, uh, yeah, so uh, to summarize, uh, yeah, I think uh, there is a little doubt that uh, globalization has peaked and the world is being disconnected and it has something to do with the uh, the relative relative decline of the u.s power and also uh willingness and uh intensifying competition between the u.s and china because u.s china china particularly because they are uh competing with the u.s strategically it is important for them to have control over the asian i'm sorry indian ocean uh, which in and of itself is is endangering connectedness uh, between the two oceans that has been taken for granted for many many years since the end of uh, of world war ii okay uh, and another takeaway uh, from today's lecture is that in the pacific has emerged as the most important region in the world. Before we think of Indo-Pacific as a concept of strategy of the US and other status quo oriented countries, I think it is very, very important for you to think of Indo-Pacific as a concept of region, new concepts, new geopolitical uh, concept of region uh, that came into existence uh, because the uh, connectedness uh, between the, the two oceans is being challenged, is, is being endangered by the uh, ascent or rise of uh, Chinese power. Uh, what are the policy implications of all this? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, Philippine also has great stakes in maintaining openness uh, in, in the Pacific. Uh, and I, I think uh, Philippines also has great straight stakes in, in maintaining, you know, rules-based uh, order in the region. You know, rule of law, uh, human rights, democracy, and all these are important uh, values that uh, Philippines and also country like South Korea uh, espouse. We, we cherish these values, and I think. Uh, uh, like-minded countries in the region, countries like uh, Philippines and South Korea will have to come together to maintain uh, connectedness, openness, and rules-based uh, international order uh, that is uh, being endangered because of the uh, new uh, geopolitical uh, situations. Okay, I, I'll just... Uh, Pause here, and I hope I didn't really take too long. And I, th I think we have some 20 minutes for questions.
and answers. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to my lecture and uh, questions and answers. Actually, we have a designated discussant, right? So uh, Dr. Michel Palumbari, if, if you can do the follow-ups with your comments and questions. Thank you. Hey, hey. thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kim, for your very insightful uh, presentation. So uh, that was really an eye-opener for us to see not just uh, the globalization in its current sense, but also its history, development, and direction or redirection. This also includes uh, debates on the colonization, uh, the globalization borderless nations, internationalization, or other possible metamorphosis of this powerful concept undergoes. Many of us maybe are wondering and have already some questions in mind, but let me just hold your excitement for the meantime and remind everyone that um, we are still tuned in to the day two of our uh, eight Philippine Korean Studies Symposium and for everyone, questions and comments may be posted on the Facebook page and YouTube channel of the UP Korea's Research Center. And Dr. Kim will address them during the open forum. And to give her own reflections and insights on Dr. Kim's keynote speech, let us welcome this session's discussion. Dr. Michelle Palumbarit obtained her doctoral degree in political science from Yonsei University Seoul in 2016 and her master's degree in Korean studies in 2012 from the same university. She has published articles on Philippine migrants in Korea, environmental ODA, water disputes in the Mekong, and Korea studies in the Philippines. She is currently an associate professor at the Asian Center, University of the Philippines, Siliman, and is in charge of the Korea studies program of the center. Her research interests include uh, Korea studies, Asian-Korea relations, Filipinos in Korea, and environmental politics. Let's have Dr. Michelle Parumbanin. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Igno. Um, a very generous introduction indeed. But I will go back to Professor uh, uh, Kim's uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Professor Jechun Kim. It's such really uh, truly interesting enlightening and uh, thought-provoking lecture. And I'm sure our participants really uh, think the same way. Um, from your presentation, here are the points that, um, that I've gathered. You made mention of um, the idea of the future of international order, um, where you pointed out uh, the concept of globalization as uh, uh, to mean coupling, integration, connectedness, and also the opposite of that, which is the globalization, the coupling, the disconnected, and then disintegration. The other point really is that um, you also cited Fukuyama, really, um, where at the end of the day, this scholar espoused that uh, liberal democracy won. Uh, what reigns supreme really is with liberal democracy. Uh, after all, there's no contender to that, not even communism. Um, also, you raised the point of globalization really the benefits of globalization, where it can benefit many, so long as you participate in, in the so-called globalization. Um, but this means, as you pointed out as well, that uh, um, the economy should be liberalized as well as the political institutions of a particular state. Um, and then you also mentioned about the decline of the geopolitics in, in this sense. Um, really what comes to mind um, when you mentioned about this is really the idea of democratic peace theory, wherein um, liberal democrat democracies, um, if you belong to one, really not only enjoy the economic benefits of, of globalization, but uh, you enjoy also the peace and security among yourselves, because liberal democrat democracies, after all, uh, they don't fight. Um, but you said also here, but that by the late 2000s, that the party is over, really, and you cited Peter Zaihan. Um, because there is a change in the foreign policy of the United States to which you contended really that uh, the United States foreign policy has become less international. You also mentioned here about the global supply chain or the global value chain which the United States created and this and also where the U.S. wants to expel China. 
Uh, this is interesting because um, it reminds me of the news last night where, according to China's ambassador to the World Trade Organization, Li Qinggang, and to quote him here, these troubling behaviors of the U.S. have clearly depict, depicted an image of the U.S. as a unilateral bully, a rule breaker, and a supply chain disruptor. Okay, so what a way to, to label the U.S. for that. Um, the other one really is you made mention about uh, the change in the national mood in the United States, and uh, that is the change in the U.S. foreign policy, again, which you mentioned it has become less international. Um, and you also contended that uh, decoupling or deglobalization is on the way because there's rise in extreme populism, um, there's a U.S.-China um, power rivalry, uh, particularly um, the ideological competition, technopolitical competition, and um, most importantly, really, uh, the geopolitical competition in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Okay, so you mentioned about the growing strategic significance of the Indian Ocean to the U.S. and China and, and their respective foreign policies. Uh, you really have uh, interesting uh, points uh, raised here, uh, Professor uh, Kim. Um, but, you know, as a scholar in me, there are many curiosities that I would like this platform, this opportunity to, to raise um, to you. Um, first of which really is that you mentioned about globalization. And globalization is a big and a very loaded concept here. But uh, you meant here really is that the economic, the political, and to some extent, the cultural globalization. Uh, may I ask Professor Chechun Kim, which aspect of this culture, of this globalization, do you see the most deglobalized or the most de decoupled in the near or far future? Um, the second part of which really is in relation to the US and China competition. Can we see not entirely a competition between the two, but also a U.S. and China cooperation where the two interests, where the two countries' interests might have converged or they have, they can share some interest here, like uh, in the non-traditional security matters, like global, um, you know, global warming, terrorism and, and the like. And finally, um, can, can we see that a possibility? And finally, you mentioned really about the globalization, uh, the decoupling. How would, I'm really curious uh, about this, how would a deglobalized or a decoupled world look like in Asia? Do you see a reduction of the U.S. presence in Asia and the dominance of China in the region? I, I will leave it as they are. You know, I, will, I would love to, to give uh, time and opportunity to our, to our um, participants as well who are very much eager to, to ask you questions. That's all for now, Professor uh, Jetson Kim, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for your insights, Dr. Palumbari. Uh, before we answer the questions that are posted uh, on our Facebook page and YouTube, uh, let us give uh, Professor Kim uh, a chance to answer or to respond to um, Dr. Palumbarit's uh, insights and comments. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for encapsulating my lecture. I think uh, that really, uh, you know, you 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 uh, ex explain the uh, subject matter uh, better than I, I delivered during the my, during my lecture. So uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, you posed three questions, uh, which are very thought provoking. Uh, which aspect of globalization is being the most endangered? I mean, uh, how do I assess? Uh, deglobalization in each different area, say uh, politics or economic globalization. I mean, uh, first thing I like to say is that globalization optimists sort of predicted that uh, despite differences in, in political systems, say China, uh, if you somehow uh, incorporate China into the system of global liberalized economy, and then economic liberalization in China, I mean, it's not really a complete economic liberalization in China, but somehow you'll have to liberalize your economy, you'll have to open your economy to the world, and that'll eventually lead to political opening in, in Chinese political system. That was 
uh, the thinking that sort of dominated U.S. foreign policy making in uh, most of 1990s and also well into the 2000s. So uh, if you ask me to sort of uh, uh, identify U.S. foreign policy toward China in that period, I would probably say it's uh, uh, both engagement and also, you know, uh, containment policy. Uh, you, you have to engage China so that they could they would become a more Im important and stakeholder country in the region. And eventually, uh, China will have to liberalize their economies and that will lead to some kind of uh, uh, political opening in not democratization, but uh, more of a, a opening to the uh, free or... or uh, more sort of a democratic uh, political system. There was an anticipation shared by many uh, in U.S. foreign policy making. So we'll have to engage China. Uh, however, uh, China's political system didn't really change. Uh, the perception in the U.S. foreign policy making right now is that they had become more uh, authoritarian uh, as uh, Xi Jinping uh, secured his third term as uh, president. Uh, so uh, now it's more of a containment. I mean, during the 1990s, 2000s, U.S. foreign policy toward China can be identified as uh, engagement policy because you have to mix uh, both containment as well as engagement policies. But uh, now there are no uh, sort of people in the U.S. who are saying that we'll have to engage China. We'll have to, uh, uh, you know, use this containment policy toward China. So uh, basically, uh, that political uh, integration uh, and uh, the Americans and, and also these, glo you know, formerly globalization optimists and uh, such as Francis Fukuyama and uh, Thomas Friedman, they are not really saying that, well, globalization would lead to homogenization of, of convergence of political system. Uh, you, you know, the, these countries have different political systems. Uh, Russia, uh, some other countries, China, they are authoritarian, you know, to be honest. The dictatorial countries, they will remain dictatorial. So in terms of politics, uh, so there is not going to be any convergence. That's one thing. And uh, so uh, economic uh, decoupling is the most palpable a phenomenon of deglobalization, I, I, I think, because, you know, I myself also believe that some five years ago, the uh, economies of the world would remain integrated, but that's not really the, the case. I mean, I, I think what we are witnessing is rather rapid decoupling of the economies, say, uh, between the U.S. and, and, and China. But uh, so, but there, there are uh, divergent views here as to how rapidly and then is it going to be really a sweeping decoupling of of economies of, of both countries. Uh, Peter Zayan is of an opinion that well, it's going to be a sweeping decoupling of two economies in, in China and the U.S. But uh, Ian Bremer is saying that, no, no, that's not true. Uh, decoupling is happening only in a few uh, economic areas, you know, a few strategic uh, industries, you know, semiconductor industry, uh, pharmaceutical, rare earth, soil, lithium battery, and so on and so forth. But uh, the two countries will, will remain heavily uh, trade dependent with each other. Uh, a number of reasons, okay, but I don't really want to go into details uh, as to why two economies would uh, remain interdependent with each other. Uh, so it's just a matter of degree, I, I guess. Uh, but, uh, you know, country like South Korea, uh, we are in a very difficult position here because uh, China, we, we have different political system and we, we have to maintain, I mean, we, we virtually have to uh, go along with the uh, American initiative uh, in, in its uh, foreign policy, uh, national security policy, economic policy. Uh, we, we'll have to be on the same page with uh, uh, Americans, but not perfectly because China is still a, a geopolitical 
reality to South Korea. Uh, because as far as North Korea is, is concerned, I, I don't really believe China will be steering North Korea into the path of denuclearization. I, I don't think uh, China is supporting reunification of the two Koreas. But however, they are have a stake. They, they can veto uh, reunification of the, of the two countries. And they, they can uh, sort of encourage, they are in a position to encourage uh, North uh, Koreans to conduct, say, uh, seventh nuclear weapons testing. So uh, that's, uh, that's uh, what I'm saying by, you know, that's what I meant by saying that China still is a very important geopolitical reality to South Korea and also very geopolitically important geoeconomic reality to South Korea as well, because, uh, you know, most of some fifty uh, percent of, of our exports still going to 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 China, uh, although we are trying to do sort of uh, you know uh, friend shoring and uh, reshoring, but still you know Chinese market is not going to. Uh, there is no you know viable alternative uh, to Chinese market for now, so you know we are in a this uh, geopolitical location. Uh, to maintain good relations, not just with Americans, but also with uh, uh, Chinese here. Um, but then again, uh, I, I, I guess if you ask me uh, what aspect of decoupling is most noteworthy, uh, to me, I, I, I think uh, uh, it's uh, decoupling in the area of economy is mostly surprising to me because it's happening to rapidly i never really believed in uh you know modernization theory that stipulated that uh, economic liberalization would eventually lead to a political liberalization so to see two you know the uh two countries say uh, china and the us uh stand uh, very uh, aloof in terms of uh, politics to see uh uh, to not see, not to see uh, political integration uh, uh, happening is not that surprising. But uh, e economic uh, decoupling, I mean, it's uh, it's unraveling so rapidly. So uh, to me, that is the most surprising part of decoupling. Uh, second question was about uh, the competition between the U.S. and China. And what was that? So can you? <laughs> Oh, okay, uh, we, so we, I can see this like, you know, black and white. It's just all about competition in the future. But can't we see also cooperation between the two countries in terms oh, of... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, part, yeah, that's a very, very important question. To me, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting uh, because Joe Biden and uh, the, the Secretary of State uh, Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, they are saying that, well, we are entering the era of strategy competition with Chinese, but there are areas in which we can cooperate with Chinese. And uh, those areas include climate change and, uh, you know, the uh, vaccine policy, how we can better combat uh, against, uh, you know, global health issues. But I don't see that cooperation happening. I mean, that's uh, one important nature of great power rivalry is that competition, say, over military area sort of uh, spread to other areas. Although they pledge that they would cooperate. I mean, if you look at the, 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 the end result of this COP27, nothing really uh, important uh, came out uh, between the two countries. I mean, it's, it's going to become a, a competition over which country is going to set the global standard for, say, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, greenhouse emission and uh, which vaccine is, is, is more is going to be a global standard setter. And that kind of competition is something that I would uh, uh, anticipate. So uh, that's uh, one uh, important aspect of great power. Rivalry is that one area of competition sort of spreads to other areas. So uh, what I would be, well, I expect that the, the competition would become uh, also, uh, there's going to be a competition over health issues, global health issues, uh, climate change, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, uh, I mean, there is more room 
for uh, cooperation in those, you know, over those issue areas. But I, I don't really anticipate closer cooperation between the two countries in those issue areas as well. And uh, do I see? Uh, Sorry, I, I jotted down your question, but it's, uh, it's almost... Yes, uh, uh, the last one, Professor, really is, um, how do you see a deglobalized or a decoupled world order in Asia? Do you oh, see yeah. the, the reduction of the U.S. presence in Asia oh, yeah, and yeah, the dominance really of China? Yeah, very interesting question. Uh, I, I think uh, Joe Biden is saying that, well, we'll be there in Asia. Uh, however... Uh, there, you know, sense, you know, I, I sense that it's what, what I sense is that Joe Biden is asking the allies to do more in the Pacific region. Uh, they are pretty much shorthanded, I guess. So, uh, militarily, uh, and uh, even in this policy of of supply chain resilience. That's uh, what they termed their, you know, decoupling policy, right? Basically expelling uh, China from strategy industries. They, they want the allies to do more. Uh, and I think uh, allies have different interests uh, in American policy toward supply chain restructuring because you know, a country like South Korea is heavily trade dependent. We are small and our GDP is like some 50 to 60 percent trade dependent. You know, the U.S. is, is I mean, the, our perspective cannot really be 100 percent the same with Americans. You, you know what I'm saying? So uh, that's why I... Uh, urge South Korean government to cooperate uh, closely with like-minded countries in Europe, in uh, also in Japan, because Japanese and, and uh, Europeans are not really 100% happy with American uh, policy of uh, protectionism and industrial policy and uh, supply chain resilience policy. Uh, so we, we'll have to cooperate uh, more closely so we can maintain uh, more of a liberal order. Uh, you know, what Americans are doing uh, in their economic policy is not really liberal at all. It's a protectionist, it's an industrial policy, it's a, you know, forceful decoupling, decoupling strategy, which is really actually doing damage to, you know, openness in, in economic order in uh, in the Pacific region. Uh, so, yeah, I think in that sense, uh, the American uh, role is being diminished by their own policies, I, I, I would probably say. And uh, in which case, I, I think uh, like-minded countries will have to step up and we'll, we'll have to uh, put in concerted efforts to maintain uh, open uh, economic order uh, in, in the region, because it, it is in our interests. I, I think I believe that Philippines is of the same opinion uh, as far as, uh, you know, economic policy is, is concerned. I, I don't know. Uh, so three important questions. Uh, I, I don't know whether I uh, answered your questions in proper manner, but uh, those you questions are great, very, very, yeah, very, very thought-provoking. Thank you for- Thank you very, very much. Questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim and Dr. Palumbari. So this session is now open for questions and comments. So we will now entertain the questions that were posted a while ago. So the first question is from uh, Professor Jean Franco. Uh, South Korea has just recently released its Indo-Pacific strategy. What are your thoughts about this? What are the potential challenges and gains emanating from this document? Thanks for your insightful presentation. Thank you uh, for that question. And there is another question uh, posted on the uh, uh, internet here, and that has something to do with this uh, 
question, and I, I'm going to read that question. Are, are there any differences in previous South Korean government's strategy toward Indo-Pacific and the current South Korean government's rather straightforward foreign policy toward Indo-Pacific region? Um, yeah, I see some differences because Moon Jae-in government, they also had what they termed as new Southern policy. Uh, as well as new northern policy, but uh, initially they were more into the new northern policy, that is to go to North Korea, to China, and to Russia, to go to Eurasia uh, from the perspective of strategy uh, in the spirit of, uh, gosh, uh, the person I just introduced. Uh, anyway, uh, but that didn't really happen. Uh, that was was sort of a futile attempt because uh, North Kore Koreans were not cooperating. All these economic projects uh, with the North Koreans uh, sh shut down, uh, you know, be because of the uh, uh, the collapse of of uh, diplomatic talks between North Koreans and and Americans, and also uh, with the South Koreans. So, Moon Jae-in government. Uh, became rather more enthusiastic about new southern policy toward the end of uh, his tenure as a, a South Korean president. Uh, the major difference between uh, Moon Jae-in's new southern policy and then Yoon Song Nair's Indo-Pacific strategy is that you know, region-wise, I mean, target country uh, was sort of limited to ASEAN countries. You know, in case of uh, Moon Jae-in's new southern policy, so the. Uh, region-wise, was limited to uh, Southeast Asian country, and and function-wise, it was basically economic policy. It was a bilateral policy, uh, bilateral in nature. I mean, reaching out to uh, ASEAN countries as a whole, but um, mainly it was uh, economic in orientation. However, uh, Yoon Sang Nair's uh, Indo-Pacific strategies is more overarching in terms of strategy it goes to the indian ocean not just to the uh, western eastern indian ocean it also incorporates western uh, indian ocean uh, north africa and it also goes to uh, these small uh, islands countries in in southern pacific so it's more overarching uh, in terms of uh, target of the region, you know, target countries, and also it is more strategic. It, it's not just limited to economic cooperation. It, it's, it's more of a strategic uh, cooperation that uh, Yoon Song-yeol government is, is, is seeking with these, uh, you know, important countries uh, in the region. So uh, ASEAN country, uh, Southeast Asian countries are, are very, very important uh, in Yoon Song Nair's, for Yoon Song Nair's Indo-Pacific strategy, but uh, our cooperation is not going to be limited to uh, economic cooperation. It's going to be more of a strategy. So uh, th there's going to be more, more of uh, uh, security cooperations uh, in the area of maritime domain awareness, you know, uh, I don't know uh, whether uh, uh, South Korean government, the Yoon Song Yeol government, will uh, jump into uh, the traditional uh, security cooperation issues. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, Yoon Song Yeol government is going to take in uh, these uh, you know, joint exercises, uh, maritime exercises. Uh, they are taking place uh, in Indo-Pacific re region, uh, Malabar uh, exercise and some other exercises uh, with the uh, Quad countries. And also, uh, I think uh, with the Philippines, uh, there is going to be a uh, some kind of uh, uh, joint uh, uh, naval cooperation in, in, I mean, in, I mean, in the area of, of uh, Security, not just uh, uh, non-traditional security issues, but also uh, traditional security issues. So it's going to be more of a sweeping uh, cooperation. Uh, but so overall, I'm I'm pretty uh, content with this uh, shift in uh, South Korea's uh, foreign policy orientation because our, our foreign policy has 
been limited to uh, to Korean Peninsula issues, and and uh, we are sort of hemmed in in Northeast Asian region, and understandably so because of of seemingly uh, important North Korean uh, uh, problems, not just the nuclear and emissions problems, but all sorts of problems that North Koreans are causing, sending these drones to South Korea and so on and so forth. But then I think a country like South Korea, uh, we will have to expand our uh, horizon uh, in making foreign policy uh, because we, we have become a rather important country in the world as, uh, you know, top 10 uh, economic power in the world. And uh, also, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe a sixth or seventh military power in the world. And not just these, you know, this hard power, but also South Korea is a cultural power represented by <laughs> South Korean, you know, pop culture and, and K-drama, so on and so forth. So uh, we will have to live up to that uh, sort of a, uh, new status that that we had obtained uh worldwide and i i, I think uh, that's what the international community is ex expecting south korea uh to do so i i i am quite positive about this uh, new foreign policy direction in in south korea yes indeed uh professor kim those uh cooperation and collaborative efforts are really very important as well as the not just the hard power but also the soft power uh, from um, South Korea and I think the whole world is learning from the Korea's experience and for our next question uh, Professor Kim uh, Republic of Korea is the latest uh, country to come up with its own in the Pacific strategy some read this as taking the US side in the great power competition why the timing? Did the Taad uh, issue and China's influence over uh, DPRK played into this move by Seoul? So this is a question from uh, Professor Lucia Pitlo. Okay, so yeah, Rang is the, the latest country to come up with its own in the Pacific strategy. Some read this as taking the side with US side in the great power competition. Why the timing did the uh, thought issue in China's influence over DPRK played into this? I, I don't think this has very little to do with the thought issue. Uh, however, the timing, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the message that that our adoption of Indo-Pacific strategies is imparting is pretty clear that uh, because Indo-Pacific strategy is basically an uh, American thing. Although uh, in the big strategy, as I said before, it was uh, Shinzo Abe and Japan. Uh, they came up with the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and Trump, Donald Trump had uh, no interest in, in, you know, in, in maintaining uh, its influence in Asia with the coherent strategic framework. That's the reason why he scrapped uh, Barack Obama's, you know, rebalancing strategy toward Asia, you know, the strategy of pivot to Asia, he basically scrapped it. He killed, you know, TP, you know, TPP, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, which was a major strategy tool of the U.S. to maintain, you know, influence in, in Asia. So Donald Trump had no interest in, in, in uh, maintaining, of course, uh, the U.S. had, Trump was interested in maintaining influence, but the you know, he, he didn't really want to engage in Asia with coherent analytic, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, strategic framework. Uh, but it was uh, uh, Japan uh, that sort of uh, persuaded uh, Donald Trump into adopting uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. But anyway, now uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, people tend to believe that, well, it's uh, basically American strategy. And I kind of agree that, I mean, it has become American strategy you know, framework toward Asia. So for South Korea to adopt Indo-Pacific strategy, sending a, a message that we are actually with Americans uh, in our strategic uh, framework toward Asia. Uh, we, we can't deny that. Uh, so, and, and Americans are very happy with the uh, Yoon Suk-yeol government's adoption of Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, previous uh, Moon Jae-in government 
was very much dithering. Why? Because if we adopt the brazil strategy, how is it going to be viewed by Chinese? It'll look like as though South Korea is, is really siding with Americans and Moon Jae-in really wanted to split the differences between uh, Americans and uh, Chinese. So he was uh, very uh, resistant uh, to the idea of adopting the Pacific strategy. So uh, sure, uh, timing and also the, the, the simple fact that South Korea adopted the Pacific strategy meant that, well, uh, you know, Yoon Suk-yeol government uh, wants to be basically on the same page uh, with Americans on its uh, strategic view or framework uh, toward uh, in the Pacific region. But that said, I mean, if you really, uh, you know, uh, read the contents of Indo-Pacific strategy released by the Yoon suk yeol government, uh, that, you know, it, it really uh, singled out China as a very, very important country for South Korea to cooperate. And, uh, there are a number of venues through which South Korea and China could cooperate with each other to enhance openness, secure openness in the region. So that's quite noteworthy uh, when Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy actually singled out China as being as posing threat to the region. A South Korean uh, version never really uh, treats uh, China in that way. Uh, and also uh, one of the uh, most important, probably the most important operating principles of South Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy is, is embracing. I mean, it, it really emphasizes our, our strategy is embracing. It doesn't really discriminate uh, against a, a, a certain country. So, I'll probably say that if Chinese read the South Korean strategy in a careful manner, they'll be very much content. Uh, actually, if uh, American uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan reads uh, South Korean Indo-Pacific strategy line by line, he won't be too happy because uh, you know our strategy is too much, maybe uh, too accommodating toward uh, uh, Chinese uh, strategy. Uh, interests, as a matter of fact. So, uh, yeah, I mean, as I said before, we are in a position to maintain good relations with that. You know, our position is uh, is quite different from Japan. Japan, I think they placed all their bets on Americans, but we, we can't really afford doing that. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this is the first version, so I, I, I think uh, we will be able to uh, improve on, on this first version uh next year there's going to be a, a, another versions but uh, for now i'm pretty content with uh, uh south korean indo pacific strategy and and uh i, I think uh we, we did a pretty good job uh, in terms of uh, walking tightrope between americans and, and chinese in uh, our indo pacific strategy uh, thank you so much dr kim and for our next question, it's from Anonymous uh, Sender. So, do you think the Chip for Alliance, to which uh, the Republic of Korea joined, can contribute in accelerating technological decoupling? Do you think this alliance is sustainable given the importance of the China market for a chip making companies like Samsung? Uh, for one thing, we didn't really join Chi4 yet. Uh, we are still contemplating. Okay, so it's so it, it's not a foregone conclusion. Well, it is actually a foregone conclusion that South Korea will join. Actually, a uh, uh, Chi4 alliance is a bit of a misnomer. I, I don't really think of it as an alliance because there is no uh, guarantee that if South Korea joins, we we, we I mean actually Americans call it. Fabulous Four, Fab Four, Fab Four, Fabulous Four. If we join uh, Fab Four, you know, Chip Four, and then if there is a, you know, retaliation coming from China, uh, then the three countries will, three other countries will have to come to South Korea's rescue. You know, that's what alliance is, is all about, right? You get attacked by your enemy, and then all other alliance partners will have to come to the uh, attacked. 
that's how you know NATO alliance is is operating. You know that's a collective security guarantee. So I don't really think of Chief Four as alliance. It's more of a close cooperation. And I don't know the uh, economic consequence of Chief Four whether uh, Samsung Electronics or SK Hynix would be uh, beneficiaries of 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 Chief Four. As a matter of fact, but I I personally believe that. Uh, you know, this Chifo, I think of it as a uh, uh, a move uh, toward the economic decoupling. And uh, for a country like South Korea, small country that is heavily uh, trade dependent, I, I don't think, uh, you know, Chifo and any other uh, decoupling movements take, taken by the U.S., uh, you know, U.S. supply chain resilience policy, would be beneficial to a country like uh, South Korea. I mean, in in terms of overall direction, uh, we favor more of an openness. Uh, we favor a multilateral approach. Uh, we we favor. Uh, we do not certainly favor uh, protectionism. Uh, industrial policy. We do not really uh, prefer uh, heavy. Uh, handy the industrial policies that uh, Americans are doing right now. So that is the reason why we were very much upset when the final draft of uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, came out, uh, because that is discriminating against not just the uh, Chinese and other, uh, you know, enemies of, of of the United States, but also against uh, key allies such as South Korea, uh, Netherlands. And and that's why uh, French President you know Emmanuel Macron was very upset when he uh, went to the U.S. to to have a summit with uh, Joe Biden. He was very very uh, uh, upfront uh, when he uh, addressed the uh, the problem of uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So uh, Chief Alliance, uh, I, I, I kind of I don't know uh, how this is going to really affect. South Korea's uh, semiconductor industry as a whole, and also the uh, fortunes of these uh, semiconductor producers. Uh, for now, uh, Samsung Electronics uh, stock prices is plummeting <laughs> uh, after the. Uh, I mean, in recent years, uh, the. Uh, I mean, I, I really don't. I don't know uh, because still uh, Samsung and Hynix they are exporting. Uh, nearly forty percent of their products to to Chinese, and we are also importing uh, from Chinese. You know these some of the uh, parts that are going into our uh, uh, our making of a semiconductor. So I, I have. I mean, I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, I don't know because uh, we, maybe we can weather out competition, weather competition with the Chinese in, in the semiconductor industry eventually. But for now, I, I don't think it is, uh, I, I think it is adversely affecting South Korean uh, semiconductor uh, giants. What are, what are the prospects about, uh, I mean, it, that's a different question or? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, I'll, stop, I'll stop for now. Yes, I'll stop for now. Okay. So thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Kim. And actually, some of the questions were already answered a while ago, and it was integrated in the uh, discussions as well uh, upon uh, Dr. Kim's answers. And for our last two questions, actually, we, will, we can integrate them together. So th these are from uh, uh, Dr. Eduardo Gonzalez and uh, Professor Celsius Watson, and these are what key roles should ASEAN play within an expanded Indo-Pacific uh, geopolitical framework, but at the same time in the context of global economic decoupling. Together, and with that, how relevant and strong will middle power states be in this evolving and challenging international order? What are your prospects about regionalism's relevance? Okay, uh, you hacked a lot in that question. <laughs> uh, yeah. ASEAN is very important. Uh, South Korea respects ASEAN's centrality. 
uh, we were very careful uh, when we drafted uh, in the Pacific region and uh, we pointed out that uh, ASEAN is the most important partner to South Korea's in the Pacific strategy, not just economically, but also strategically. You know, it's uh, going to be a strategic uh, relationship between ASEAN, but you know, the trend in, in the Pacific region, the cooperation that is play, taking place there is more of a, a mini-lateral, not multilateral. Why? Because multilateral, should I say, institution like ASEAN, it's, it's not really agile. It's not really going anywhere, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, think of the ALF, Asian Regional Forum. You know, the only thing they agree is that they can disagree, right? I mean, it's uh, so ASEAN, one important spirit of ASEAN is that it really respects uh, autonomous decisions of these sovereign member countries, right? So, uh, you know, all these participants in the Indo-Pacific region with their own Indo-Pacific strategies is that we got to uh, take advantage of these mini-lateral venues not only a called or AUKUS, uh, these, you know, well-known unilateral mechanisms, but if you really uh, take a uh, look, you know, deeper into what is really happening in the Pacific region in terms of cooperation is this, uh, you know, mushrooming of these unilateral cooperations. So unilaterals, uh, they have overwhelming advantage because they can move very agilely. I mean, it's uh, more of a... a one, it can be more of a one-time cooperation, uh, cooperation. I mean, the, the on ad hoc, you know, uh, basis. Uh, so that that's the name of the game that uh, we are uh, witnessing, and that I think is the reason why these minilaterals are mushrooming in the region. And I, I believe that. So it's it's going to be it's not going to be a South Korea and ASEAN, you know kind of uh, a cooperation rather it's going to be a, a more specific cooperation say between south korea and the philippines on these specific issue areas where you know both countries feel that uh, cooperation in these over these specific issue areas would uh, be mutually beneficial to both countries i mean i think that's the kind of cooperation uh, that we will be witnessing more uh in the region and uh, in South Korea's strategy uh, toward uh, in the Pacific region. So I'm afraid to say that, and I, I think a lot of uh, ASEAN enthusiasts would worry that, uh, you know, these minilateral uh, cooperations could uh, 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 do some damage to, uh, to ASEAN. Uh, and if you think of uh, ASEAN uh, as a regionalism, uh, it's kind of uh, in danger, should I say, uh, because um, more and more countries are looking forward to cooperate with each other uh, through minilateral venues. But the overall trend is, as I said uh, during my lecture, blockization. I mean, uh, you know, there, there is a uh, economic block uh, that is, uh, you know, it's that economic block has always there in, in uh, say, uh, in uh, North American continent, but is is getting uh, stronger and stronger because of the uh, U U.S. policy. They, they are strengthening their economic ties with the Canadians and Mexicans. Uh, so, uh, what's the name of MC, uh, MCU, you know, so, so that, that kind of uh, regional economic blocks, I, I think they will be more, uh, of, of, a, I, I don't know, uh, coherence or, uh, they, they, you know, the, the economic activities of more and more countries will become. Uh, not worldwide, but uh, region-wide, region-wide economic activities, uh, uh, more of uh, uh, activities that you, you will be uh, witnessing down the road, I guess, because of the uh, 
uh, weakening of globalization. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kim. So with that, I think that answered uh, our uh, questions and some of the comments uh, posted in our Facebook page. And we would like to thank uh, everyone who participated in the question and answer, as well as some comments in the uh, comment sections. And for now, uh, again, and thank you for so much for your uh, active participation in our discussions. And to conclude this morning session, let me read the certificate of appreciation for Dr. Kim Chetsun. Uh, certificate of appreciation. This certificate is presented to Jetson Kim, uh, PhD, for delivering the keynote lecture titled The Future of International Order and U.S.-China Competition at the 8th Philippine Korean Studies Symposium organized by the University of the Philippines, Korea Research Center, and the Department of Linguistics at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, given on the 28th uh, of, the gen of January, 2023. Signed, Kyung Min Bae. Uh, uh, OIC Director, uh, UP Korea Research Center, and Maria Cristina Gallego, Chairperson, UP Department of Linguistics. As well as uh, the Certificate of Appreciation presented to uh, Dr. Michelle Palumbarit for ser serving as a discussant at the 8th Philippine Korea Studies Symposium organized by the UP Korea Research Center and the Department of Linguistics at the University of the Philippines given on the 28th day of January 2023. Signed, Kyung Min Bae, OIC Director, UP Korea Research Center, and Maria Cristina Gallego, Chairperson, UP Department of Linguistics. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> okay. So. And. Okay, so and with that, the, we formally conclude this morning session. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. To those of you who are tuned in live, you may claim your certificate of attendance after you have accomplished the evaluation form, the link of which will be provided throughout the session. And the Google form will be open until 5 p.m. today, uh, January 28, 2023. And thank you once again for tuning in to this morning session. And to those who will be watching the recording of this installment of the Philippine Korea Studies Symposium in the future, this is J.R. Igno, your moderator for day two morning session. We will have a lunch break and after research presentations will start at uh, 1.30 p.m. You may click the live streaming uh, links to virtually join us again later. But once again, thank you, our speaker and discussant and everyone who joined. See you later. Kamsahamida. Maraming salamat.